him already. So I just say, look, he's, he's chief executive of... Uh... I guess over the last two days, we've pretty much done to death the dairy holding story. And we've, uh, we've heard a lot of themes come out over the conference. And the number of times we've talked about the importance of harvesting pasture and just the sheer importance of that in terms of profitability and cash flow. Uh, it's, uh, it's almost as if I'm preaching to the converted. But I guess what I was keen to do now in this, uh, in this final session of the conference was really just, it's really a journey back to basics with dairy holdings. And we've talked, you know, quite extensively about the dairy holdings business and the size and scale that it has been able to achieve. But I wanted to take the opportunity and go back and focus on the simple things that we follow in our business. And these, this will almost be like sort of, as we would say in New Zealand, teaching your grandmother to suck eggs in terms of yourselves with the key principles behind pasture and grazing management. But a lot of the things in New Zealand that we, uh, that we focus on and that we follow quite closely are really because of the research that was undertaken back through the 1950s and the 1960s. And we, I guess, as a nation in New Zealand, and certainly yourselves here, your testament to the real research and the efforts that were put in by Mr. Or Dr. C.P. Campbell McMeekin back in the 1950s and 60s. And very much that research holds as true today as it did back then. It's just that today we've got a whole lot of other additives in terms of uh, other tools at our disposal that we're able to use. But that's something that's been picked up over the generations and certainly Dr. Arnold Bryant continued to bounce that ball and the growth of the New Zealand dairy industry, not just in the North Island, but then the movement into the South Island and the growth and the expansion that's occurred over the last 25 years is testimony to the success and the foresight of that investment that was put in all those many, many years ago. But I guess for me, it was all at the very, very outset, it was very much based on the research that was undertaken. And out of that research, there are a whole lot of key drivers. And what New Zealand, in my simple view, was quite good at doing was putting that research into a very simple context and developed a massive range of tools that enabled us to put into practice at scale those key drivers that have really held or underpinned the industry for the years that have followed since. And I guess what we've seen in dairy holdings is that we've seen those same principles alive and well today. And I've got just a number of slides here that I'm quickly going to flick through, but there, I guess the point that I want to get across is that the themes are as relevant today as they ever have been. And what this slide here that's up on the screen now demonstrates to you, this is looking at just some of the financial data from Dairy Holdings contract milk farms for last dairy season. So this was the dairy season where we had an $8.40 milk price. Now the significance of that is if there was ever a year in dairy holdings history where someone could suggest that there would be more money to be made from feeding cows to the genetic potential, and we've heard that a bit already, then last year was it. But this graph that we've got up here shows for you the spread that we had for our contract milk farms and feed costs per hectare. So you see there along the horizontal graph right out to you know, just under twelve dollars or $1,300 per hectare, the feed cost that was expended by some of our farms. And you'll see in the, uh, the axis up the left-hand side, milk revenue, less feed cost per hectare, and where that's at. There is no correlation. Even in the highest milk price year we've experienced in my dairying career, there was no correlation whatsoever between extra feed going in and profit. In converse, if you look at this slide, that looks at the theoretical pasture harvested or pasture utilised per hectare and the relationship with profit or the relationship with milk returns less feed costs. The linkage is as strong as any other parameter we have in the entire dairy holdings business. Now that was with our contract milk farms. Our lower order share milk farms the relationship is exactly the same. 
And all that's suggesting is that the different operating structures that we have, they're very much aligning the returns between the farm owner and our operators on farm. We're all pushing in exactly the same direction. Our driver is very, very much on profit, which in turn is very much on optimising, and, or dare I say it to the point, maximising pasture harvested. Now, I just want to go back a step, though. So what are the key things, then, that, what are the principles that we put in place to maximise the amount of pasture that we are harvesting per hectare across not just the 56 dairy farms, but also our wintering blocks, our young stock, young stock operations, and the bull service bull operations that we have as well. I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but the, you've got to start with soil fertility. And we had quite a number of presentations yesterday around the key drivers for you know, pasture establishment, soil fertility levels, and getting the, uh, the P, the K, the pH levels at the correct levels. I'm not going to dwell on that. Take it for red. Take it as red. Those things are absolutely crucial. And what you see with dairy conversions in New Zealand is that all that investment is right front end loaded. And from my point of view, that was the major revolution in New Zealand dairy in the 1990s. Historically, those investments took place over 10, 15 year time frames. And you could almost go to sleep waiting for the responses to come through. The conversions that started in the 1990s and flow through right to today, that investment is all right on day one. And so we see the benefits flow through virtually immediately. And it's absolutely crucial, and I don't want to downplay it, but it's so crucial that that investment does take place at the front. If, you're not, if you haven't set up your pastures well, your soil fertility uh, levels well, and in New Zealand's case, and certainly in Canterbury, in the South Island of New Zealand, your irrigation systems, if they're not set up effectively, then you are not set up to grow the optimum or the maximum amount of pasture you possibly can. So take it as read, that must happen. What I want to do now is just move on and look at the key things with dairy holdings that we've put in place to then be able to optimise the amount of pasture that we harvest per hectare. Now these next slides, they're drawn from some papers that uh, Kevin MacDonald and he might have done this in conjunction with John Roach as well, but Kevin MacDonald, a scientist from uh, Dairy NZ in New Zealand, has put an awful lot of effort into looking at the linkage between stocking rate and pasture harvested. And in New Zealand, he's developed this, uh, this definition called high, or sorry, comparable stocking rate, which looks at the live weight per hectare relative to the underlying possible pasture that's able to be grown per hectare. And depending on the amount of live weight you're carrying relative to that underlying pasture growth rate, that looks at the stocking rate or your comparable stocking rate that you're operating under. What this slide here shows is that pasture utilisation increases the higher your stocking rate per hectare. Now that almost goes without saying, and I guess the challenge with that is people could look at this quite simply and say, well that's easy. That just means the more cows you put on per hectare, the more pasture you're going to harvest. Yes, that's right, but there's a whole lot of other decision rules that you've got to have in place with that. And look, you will have uh, forgotten a lot of these things in your own businesses, but it's not, while putting extra cows on might increase pasture utilisation, it doesn't necessarily increase profit. And I guess the point from the research that was undertaken in New Zealand quite some time ago was that as the, oh, sorry, I should go back. There is a sweet spot with comparable stocking rate. And while there's a sweet spot that optimises or really maximises economic farm surplus and optimises pasture harvested, there are quite a number of different decision rules that are in place depending on where your comparative stocking rate sits. And for dairy holdings, we consciously, at a very, very early stage in the business, made a call that we were going to operate high comparable stocking rate systems. So what does that mean? That means that the system, irrespective of the quantum of pasture that we grow, we stock our farms aggressively. Now it's very easy for us to talk stocking rate and just assume all farms are capable of growing the same amount of pasture per hectare. We know across all the regions, that that's not necessarily the case. 
And certainly there are farms that are well irrigated, well fertilised, all the rest in Canterbury, that are capable of growing, as we've heard the challenge, you know, up in excess of 18 tonne of dry matter per hectare per year. <coughs> Equally, there are farms that can't get anywhere near that because of where they're geographically located. Irrespective of that, high comparable stocking rates sets ourselves up where we're able to harvest as much of that pasture as possible. I just want to, these, these next uh, slides are all included in your booklets, but I just wanted to touch on a few key themes associated with high comparable stocking rate systems, because this is where Dairy Holdings has chosen to position ourselves, because we believe stocking rate systems at these levels are able to be repeated in their performance time and time again. And I guess that's the key bit that I'm trying to get across. So it means that we need to be very, very disciplined in terms of our grazing rounds, in terms of the pre-grazing covers that we're operating under, and in terms of our residuals. It means that we are absolutely focused on ensuring grazing rotations are right, particularly through the springtime, and we cannot compromise on that at any time. But we've also got a whole lot of other targets that we've got to have in place at the same time. And that includes body condition scoring, and we've heard a lot of that already. But those other systems absolutely are key and must be adhered to. Got rotation uh, length sitting there as well. But also, you see planned start of calving. Effectively, high comparable stocking rates put you under pressure on your farm. And by putting yourself under pressure, sets you up to harvest the maximum amount of pasture you possibly can. So, Yes, we operate high comparable stocking rate systems, but because we do, spring pasture management for us is absolutely crucial. And I guess the crucial thing with spring pasture management, and this comes back to what is effectively our Bible. And our Bible is the spring rotation planner. And it's been interesting through this conference, I've already heard the spring rotation planner referred to quite a number of times, where you're effectively allocating the proportion of your farm that you're grazing each day through to that magic day when feed demand uh, and supply equate. But the bit that we quite often forget is the target that goes hand in hand with the spring rotation planner around average pasture cover levels. And I want to touch on that because, not because I'm expecting that uh, people in this room will necessarily not be aware of it, but because with dairy holdings, when we set out on the journey, that was the number one mistake we made in the early days. That is, we were very good at allocating the proportions of the farm to be grazed, but what we forgot to do, or what we weren't very good at conveying to our people to do, was to keep checking in on how pasture covers changed through, the, through that spring period. And the key thing with the, with the spring rotation planner is effectively it means that your your average pasture cover is steadily coming down as you approach that magic day. But what we often forget to do is to then continually monitor our pasture covers and amend our grazing rotations as our covers either fall under or rise above the spring rotation planner targets. And that's quite crucial. Why? High pasture covers increase senescence in the pasture, they re reduce the vigour and the regrowth, as we know, after that first grazing round can be very, very slow. So quite often, we find that we can get through first grazing rounds very, very easily in New Zealand, no problems at all. But it's the second round when we come under pressure, and it's the second round is absolutely crucial in terms of optimising our pasture harvested and then setting ourselves up on a rising plane of nutrition as we head into the making period. And that is the time when the men get separated from the boys in terms of managing the dairy farms. So close adherence to that spring rotation planner, close adherence to the average pasture cover targets is absolutely crucial for us. And if there is one thing where our supervisory team hone in on more than anything else, it is that rotation planner and that rotation planner alone. And we have the support with Leighton Parker, our systems manager, who is effectively the mother-in-law for all our farm supervisors, challenging them to make sure that all of their farmers are on that target. In terms of uh, some of the, sorry, just go back a sec. 
In terms of the next part of the systems that we put in place, I don't want to sort of labour this too long, but tight calving spreads are absolutely key. Obviously getting cows in milk as soon as we possibly can is so fundamental to a pasture grazing system, it goes without saying. But all of that emanates in the first place from spring management the year before. So where you get your spring management right, adherence once again to the spring rotation planner, effectively sets us up to optimise the pasture grown, pasture harvested, and sets our cows up on a rising plane of nutrition in the lead up to mating. Simply by following that system alone ensures we have tight calving spreads. Dairy holdings, we have no intervention in terms of uh, reproductive management on any of the farms. It's entirely uh, through uh, about four to five weeks of artificial insemination, followed by service bulls. And with that, we've been able to enjoy six-week calving rates of approximately 77%. So we're just at 1% under the target. But at scale, we're quite pleased with that. But our in-calf rate, or sorry, our, our non-in-calf rate, after 12 weeks, has consistently been sitting under 9% now throughout the life of the company. And that's provided us with surplus livestock as well as having cows coming into profit or cows coming into milk very early. So tight calving spreads are so absolutely crucial. So spring management and reproductive performance in those early stages are absolutely crucial. We talked earlier today about once a day milking. And once a day milking through those early days, particularly where farms are coming under pressure and where farms have cows that are lighter in condition, is such a valuable tool for us. And I mentioned how we will set up procedures in place on farms where we're encouraging people to continually draft cows between mobs through that spring period. All that's doing is that's getting people to check their cows and put the disciplines in place around animal husbandry. As we've, we've found that as we focus on pasture management, as we focus on our grazing residuals, often on dairy holdings farms, the biggest mistake we can make is that we're always looking at the pasture and we forget to lift our eyes to look at the cows. It's the very opposite from what many others in the dairy industry would potentially be doing, focusing on fully feeding their cows, because of course, we're focusing first and foremost on the pastures, and sometimes that can be the biggest mistake we make. Just want to move forward now and talk about monitoring, because monitoring is so very, very crucial for us. And we've already mentioned about you know, weekly pasture walks and the importance of entering that data into the system. So the feed wedge that's uh, generated as an example here is such a valuable tool for us and it's not because you know you get a pretty picture and uh, I mean yes you can uh, try and preempt what's coming in the weeks ahead in terms of surpluses and deficits and be ready for them but there's so many other things that you open your eyes to when farm walks are undertaken but what we find we're really good at and I'd suggest to you that uh, that you'd probably be no different is that when we see a deficit coming through on our feed wedges we find that we start looking to you know, our weather forecasts for the upcoming week, we look at our soil temperatures, and we're always trying to talk ourselves into things coming better. Invariably, they don't. And so the early decision, early decisions that we make with our, with our farm walks in, in reaction to feed surpluses and deficits are always the best decisions. In fact, I can't give you one example over all the years within dairy holdings where an early call with slowing down our grazing round and getting ourselves back on the, uh, to, to set ourselves back on our targets with our feed wedge puts us in a worse financial position. In fact, invariably, what happens with us is that we see farms that are operating too conservatively waste the extra feed that they've given at the start of the season and effectively, they have nothing to show for it at the end of the day. So what does that mean? That means the farms that put themselves under most pressure in the spring capture the biggest prize. So you need to push the boundary. We certainly find that we need to push the boundaries in terms of our stocking rates and our feeding levels to be able to capture as much pasture as we possibly can. 
There are other things, though, that come from monitoring. And um, this next slide, it's a, little, it's a little bit hard to see, but I've, I'll just touch on it. What this is doing is this is capturing some of the data off the internet from our weekly pasture walks. But what, so what's some of the stuff that's been captured here? It's showing first and foremost, when was the last farm walk entered? And this is benchmarked on the website for all dairy holdings farms to see. So everyone's able to see who didn't enter their farm walk data within the last fortnight. And that's that one farm highlighted in red there in the second column. Everyone gets to see that. So there's, we're always putting peer pressure on our people to be able to enter data and get it up there and show that they're regularly, mon regularly, regularly monitoring that information. Also, there are some other key drivers there uh, as well. Uh, you know, for example, pre-grazing covers where they, might be, where they might be pushing too high or at the other extreme where grazing residuals might be just a little bit tight. But the fact is that we are benchmarking all farms with all names there so there's full transparency across all the farms. Some of the other things that come from this information is we're increasingly using this data to drive our regrassing decisions on farms. We're highlighting farms where the poor performing paddocks and the high performing paddocks have the greatest difference. Those are the farms that we are targeting first for aggressive regrassing. And often there's a whole lot of other things there as well. There can be challenges with irrigation on some of those farms. There can be soil fertility issues that need to be addressed as well. But this data becomes absolutely invaluable. The information that's come out from uh, the Lincoln University dairy farm already suggests that farmers are not always as sharp as they would think they are when it comes to identifying poor performing paddocks. So it's quite good to have the real live data to really get some objectivity around those calls. The other thing that's quite important for us is in mani when managing spring pastures and spring covers is how we manage our surpluses and our deficits. I mentioned before that a real key thing for dairy holdings is that we need to put ourselves under pressure. We need to be pushing ourselves all the time so that, in fact, as Adrian van Beisterfeld has often used the phrase in New Zealand, that we can only see one or two days in front of ourselves. And where we're in that position, that's where we're in the sweet spot on the farm. Equally, when we see deficits coming, how we plan to handle those deficits can also be crucial as well. The data out of Dairy NZ, when they go back into their archives deeply enough, they can certainly see this, is that the farms that are most successful in terms of optimising the pasture that they harvest consciously do not fully fill a feed deficit. And just think about what that means. When, you're fully, when you are fully filling a feed deficit, it means that you have already committed yourselves to a gap in that feed supply for your cows. It means that you've already written the cheque out and that already you're reconciled to the fact that you cannot take advantage of more favourable conditions if they arise. What we find, or what we do as a conscious call, is that when we're planning in advance, if we are managing or if we're planning for a deficit at a certain period of time, we will only ever put in arrangements in place to fill half that gap. And by filling half that gap, if we get more favourable pasture growing conditions, or if for whatever reason things turn out to be more favourably than we first thought, we capture a gain. He who dares wins. And I guess that's the main theme that comes out time and time again in the dairy holdings business and certainly in terms of optimising our past utilisation across the farms. The key bit is, is that you must always have a plan B. So you can push things aggressively, and we have often done that, believe you me. We've had positions in the past where we've had cows that are losing live weight, and farms have been in difficult positions. But always we've got somewhere to go. Now, you could, in your business, opt to have a, a big silage bunker. You could contract some extra grazing down the road. You could send your cows, dry cows, off farm for a period of time. There's a lot of things that you can do. 
But what I challenge you about is that you can actually make a call as whether you commit to writing the cheque out up front and by making silage on farm or buying silage in advance in anticipation of a fee deficit, you have already written the cheque. But if you've got options where you can be living hand to mouth in terms of filling a fee deficit, you're only committing the minimum that you need to. The other thing is, when you've got a big supply of silage or purchase feed on farm, invariably we find that we use it. The number of times I could show you examples of dairy holdings where even with whether it's palm kernel or silage, where we have a stack of feed on farm, people will use it for convenience reasons. One may be just because it's an inconvenience and they want to get rid of it. The other reason may be that, look, it's just, it's there. We didn't know whether things were going to improve over the next week or not, so we thought we'd just use it and get it out of the way. What harm could it possibly do? But the point is, is that any time we don't push the business, we set ourselves up for mediocrity and we set ourselves up where we're not optimising what we can harvest. So, for dairy holdings, I guess the message is pretty simple, really, at the end of the day. High past utilisation is the number one driver, particularly through the springtime, for high profitability and high cash flow. We've equally adopted a number of other systems throughout other times of the year with our rotation planners, particularly through autumn when we set ourselves up to hit targets at the back end of the season and moving into the dry off period. They are absolutely crucial as well, but all they are really doing is setting ourselves up so we're on track to achieve our targets as we move in to the spring calving period. High stocking rates are the key driver for us to achieve high pasture harvested. There's a big drive in New Zealand amongst some to reduce stocking rates, and by reducing stocking rates, driving higher per cow production. That, I put to you, is a slippery slope. And that drive is incredibly hard to farm at scale across a multiple number of businesses. And that's why, for dairy holdings, we have consciously made the call to target higher stocking rate systems. <coughs> There are other drivers in place you know, that are absolutely key that help you enhance the amount of pasture that you harvest. How you manage your on-off grazing, how you avoid poaching and pugging on pastures, how you manage your pasture regrassing programs. There's a whole lot of things like that that are also key, but those are incidental to the underlying driver. It's really important that you've got pressure with mouths per hectare on farm to achieve those higher levels. Consistent high levels of pasture harvested across all the business units, both dairy farms, heifer units and bull beef have been absolutely fundamental to the growth of the business. Profitability through people management, a systemised approach and maximising pasture harvested have been the key drivers to the whole growth of the dairy holdings business effectively since it was set up nearly 15 years ago. It's that business ethos that has held us well placed over the last few years and I'd suggest to you leaves us very well placed for the challenges ahead in the years to come. And particularly as we're looking to 2015, 2015 is going to be a very, very interesting year <laughs> on a whole lot of fronts. Yes, we're going to have low payout. Yes, it's going to make us focus on profitability and yes, it's going to make businesses that have effectively strayed in the last little while refocus on the basics. But look, there's also some other things that are going to happen in 2015 that we shouldn't forget. Because at the end of the day, as we've already heard, it's not just about dairy farming, it's about lifestyle as well, isn't it? And with lifestyle, you've got to have a good team that you've got to support at the end of the day as well. So I'll leave you with that. Get that off. Get that logo off. <laughs>